Good morning and thank you for joining us. My name is Kim Lawrence and I lead Visa's business here in the US. I'd like to thank the SBA and Administrator Guzman for inviting Visa to be part of this special event recognizing America's small businesses. And I am honored to be here with you today to help kick off National Small Business Week. I have invited a special guest to join me in a few minutes, but before I welcome him, I wanna take a minute to recognize and celebrate America's small business owners and entrepreneurs, and to share a bit about Visa's commitment to small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy and the heart and soul of our communities. They make up 90% of global businesses and more than 50% of global employment. They help us build lifelong connections and make us feel at home in our neighborhoods. While the pandemic has impacted just about everyone around the world, some of the most severe impacts have been felt by small businesses. It has been remarkable to witness the resilience and resolve of small businesses across the US in the face of tremendous adversity, and yet challenges still remain. Simply put, the economy won't fully recover until small businesses recover. Over the last 18 months, small business owners were forced to quickly rethink how they do business. Some of this may ring true for many of you. Consumers are demanding safer and more touchless ways to pay. And in response, we have seen more small businesses adopt contactless payments. We have seen small businesses embrace new models and sales channels, establishing online stores and launching new digital capabilities like delivery and order ahead services. And small businesses are implementing new technologies like digital marketing and social media to engage customers in new and different ways. Digital services and capabilities will be key for small businesses to continue to grow and thrive. The ways in which small businesses have adapted represent stories of inspiration, motivation, and resilience. I have experienced this firsthand. One of my favorite examples comes from a recent wine tasting event I hosted with my leadership team. We found a small black owned winery in Napa who offered to do a virtual wine tasting. Prior to the pandemic, the only way you could taste their wine was to travel to the Napa Valley and sit in their tasting room. When the pandemic hit, they quickly pivoted and set up operations to facilitate virtual tastings. They now ship the wine to your home along with suggested food pairings ahead of time and a member of their team joins the Zoom call to share the history of the winery and talk you through the tastings. Not only was this a fun event, it was an amazing success story. The winery shared that they now host tastings across the US and around the world. The pandemic actually helped them grow and expand their business. In the face of adversity, there is optimism. Small business owners continue to press forward pivoting business models, reimagining practices, and inspiring us their, with their resiliency and perseverance. At Visa, we are committed to doing our part to invest in and support small businesses as part of our mission to be a network that works for everyone everywhere. Last year, we committed to help digitally enable 50 million small businesses globally. And I am proud to share that to date, we have supported 16 million small businesses in this effort. We have also mobilized Visa's solutions, resources, and vast network of partners to support small businesses, providing access to capital through grant programs, providing expert business coaching and mentorship opportunities, launching our practical business skills, which is a financial education and training program for small businesses, and building the online small business hub that provides free information and resources to help put small businesses on a pathway to success. Visa is also supporting BIPOC-owned businesses to help renew, revitalize, and drive commerce in underserved communities. One way we are doing this is by collaborating with partners bringing underrepresented communities access to digital payments. This is an incredible area of focus for us, and you'll hear more about it during a session tomorrow. Two of our partners, First Boulevard and Regions Bank, will join a special discussion led by Shelly Bell, the founder of Black Girl Ventures, and two small business owners who will share their own stories about unlocking access. It promises to be a great segment, and I hope you will tune in. While recovery and renewal are still very much underway, I am optimistic. Your collective success is critical to our communities, main streets, and the economy overall. And now I wanna welcome our special guest, Matt Forte. Matt is a former NFL running back for the Chicago Bears. 
His foundation, What's Your Forte, works to uplift, impact, and empower today's youth by building a sense of community, providing education, and creating mentorship opportuni opportunities. He recently launched an initiative designed to support Black entrepreneurs in underserved communities in Chicago. Matt, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today at National Small Business Week. Hey, Kimberly, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Can you start by telling us how you first got involved with the small business community and what specifically inspired your connection to small businesses? I'd say specifically what inspired me was during the pandemic, noticing how many of the small businesses and black owned businesses that were struggling uh, during that time, like most businesses were, but at a different rate. Um, you know, it's a fact that uh, a lot of black owned businesses have a uh, hard time having access to capital, um, whether they're uh, qualified or not. And so that's, that's a problem. And so when I used to see that, um, I wanted to do something or create something within my own foundation and use my platform that I've had from the NFL to be able to impact that area and positively help some people out. Um, I'm not one to walk by someone that's laying on the ground that can't help themselves. I have to I have to help them out. And so when you see something, I always say, if you see something, you have to do something. Because a lot of us, we, we like to talk about the problem instead of actually addressing the issue. So that was my inspiration behind getting involved in this and trying to uh, empower the community basically from the inside out through entrepreneurship and um, providing access to capital. That's amazing. Uh, your foundation recently launched a new program it's called Your Forte, Our Finances. Can you tell us about the work that you're doing there? Yeah, it's, it's been a, a, uh, an amazing uh, program that we've you know, implemented as far as something new that we've done. We uh, mostly have been involved in youth entrepreneur, I mean, youth uh, development with, you know, um, kind of mentorship and doing those things, which this is a, a part of that, but also on a larger scale where it's not just the youth, it's adults and people who maybe want to start a business or have already had have a business. And um, how we do that is uh, I partner with a lady named Erica King, who is the founder of uh, Chicago Neighborhood Initiative Microfinance Group, which is there. They're currently going through a name change is to it's called Greenwood Archer Capital um, to represent the uh, stuff that happened in Tulsa. Oklahoma back when the Tulsa bombings happened. So um, needless to say, I joined forces with her and she had been doing this for a while. And I wanted to piggyback and on what she was already doing to provide a bigger platform to let a lot of black owned businesses and, and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs know that there is a way in which you can have access to capital um, that will provide you a way to increase your business and be able to expand or uh, provide some help where needed. And so uh, through this process, we've actually given out over three million in, in, uh, in grants and loans. Um, the average loan was, uh, I believe, just over twenty thousand dollars. And um, we've helped a lot of people to be able to pivot during this pandemic period and, um, you know, get over some of the issues that they've been facing uh, due to the pandemic. That's fantastic. Really good stuff. Um, what are, as you've been engaging with small business entrepreneurs in these efforts, what are some of the top challenges or needs you're hearing from small business entrepreneurs that are just getting started? Um, some of the top needs, I would say, number one would be just the access to capital. Um, like I said before, you know, whether qualified or not, a lot of the qualified um, business owners that apply for loans and grants somehow they, they just get denied and you know i have no rhyme or reason behind it and i've heard so many stories behind that um for whatever reason I've, I've heard it all from them but for some reason they just they they need the capital to be able to you know do a lot of things that will help them you know especially in this, this the pandemic and stuff um but the, the access is like one of the main things but then also um keeping up with the, having the, the, the money to keep up with what's going on, being, being able to social media promote or, or market that way, um, having technology that will make their business uh, streamline and run smoother 
um, like you were talking about with the, the black owned winery, how they were able to, you know, uh, transfer from just only in in their wine room, being able to taste things to expand virtually. Um, a lot of businesses, they don't have the capacity or the capital to be able to do that. So they need that access to um, to be able to do that. And that's probably one of the main issues that I've seen. So you've talked a lot about investing and the need for capital in helping small businesses get off the ground. Beyond that, why do you think it's so vital that we support and invest in small businesses today? And in particular, the importance of supporting underserved and black black owned businesses. What what is it that's so important about it and what's driving your efforts? I think what's so important about it is pretty much what you said earlier is how small businesses are the backbone of uh you know this this country and there's so many communities where like you said it's 90 percent and above that are developed are full of um, um small businesses but when you talk about the, the community like where i serve on the south and the west side of chicago is predominantly black and brown people who own these businesses that in these neighborhoods they're highly disinvested and so when you invest in these these small uh, businesses, it helps garner uh, more job openings for people who are looking for jobs. It helps to keep the money circulating within the community and also many different things as well as like, it, you know, they're able to, when, when you support that business, they're able to establish a, a cash reserve where they can actually use some money or, or save money to, to increase their, their business. Um, and they can develop and grow their own workforce. You have to have the cash reserve to be able to develop your own works, workforce and be able to expand um, that way and grow the business. Um, to be able to secure real estate, that's one of the main things too, uh, speaking of the, the issues they're facing is to secure business real estate because if you're just leasing and renting out a spot and, and you're paying rent on that and rent goes up, and you're struggling at this time, it's going to be hard to continue that business. So if you own the spot, you own the real estate, you're able to, you know, cut that that cost and able to um, to save money that way, which allows you to have a cash reserve. It's kind of a uh, they're all connected. You know, if you're able to have that that stuff um, or own the, the uh, real estate within the community, um, it also helps the community not to be gentrified when it comes in and they you know develop the neighborhood. It's not too costly where people who are of lower income have to move out. And so we don't want to see those things. And so when you invest in those small businesses, um, it allows, uh, like we were talking about with the access to technology um, to uh, enhance their operations and streamline that. But then also um, from a marketing and promotion standpoint, they can kind of get with the times, you know, they're not, you know, behind the, the, the ball uh, as far as getting, you know, technology and, and promotion and marketing, because word of mouth is good and it works and it spreads fast, but it can't be the only way to market and promote. And so I think that um, they're all connected together. And uh, I think that that is what helps the community do that. And um, it's actually why I've been so passionate about it is because noticing that there's a huge wealth gap between underserved communities, obviously, and, and, uh, communities that, that are highly developed. And so being able to have the cash reserve and these black owned businesses and, and brown, you know, businesses where they can support and, and earn money, I think they'll be able to have and create ownership, not only within their, their business, but for themselves as well, uh, with home ownership and, and those type of things. So important. Many entrepreneurs and business owners are still facing serious challenges, right? You, you've mentioned some of them. I've talked about some of them in my opening remarks. You no doubt have faced challenges of your own on your own path, whether it's been on the football field, growing up, and even over the past number of years as you've embarked on your foundation. Can you share any words of wisdom, motivation, inspiration that has helped you get through some tough times? Yeah, definitely. Um, anytime I've been encountered, you know, opposition, which the first thing you have to notice is that you will incur opposition and, and uh, resistance in, in your in your walk in life. And so when that happens, it's to focus on what you can control. And that's your attitude about how you go about it, um, your emotions um, about how, you know, 
you can control your emotions, I, I would say, to not get too high when the times are good and not to get too low when times are bad, but then also to be resilient. Resilience is not um, being unfazed by anything. I think resilience is being able to move and and uh, counteract when things come your way to be able to be able to be successful uh, when times look rough or when things look like the eyes are against you. And so business resiliency or resiliency as a person, I think is a huge um, character trait that a business or a person should have in their life because it allows you to, uh, for lack of a better term, roll with the punches when, when they come. And so um, resiliency and, 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 and I think being, being upbeat and, and uh, not pessimistic about things helps a lot too. Um, you know, you can, it's easy to fall into that trap of when, you know, things don't look good to just say, oh, okay, here we go again. And uh, I've seen, I've been on football teams where that happens, where you had a bad season one year and then you lose a couple of games and people say, all right, here, you, here we go again. But you can't buy into that because things can turn around, you know, like that. So I think it's important to be resilient and to uh, have a good attitude about that and to control what you can control. And that's how you go about each day, how you treat people. And um, and I think it'll, it goes a long way uh, uh, throughout life, but then also in, in the business that you have. So uh, this past weekend, I guess yesterday was our the big kickoff for the NFL. Uh, any early thoughts or predictions as the, the season gets underway? Do you have any favorites for taking it all the way to the end? Yeah, man, I'm I'm a little sad. You know, the Bears had a primetime game and they played uh, all the way out in, in L.A. and they struggled a little bit. But uh, for one thing, I know the, the rookie quarterback did look good when they put him in. Um, uh, I think we have a lot to improve on. But the only <laughs> silver lining of that is that Green Bay got blown out last night, or yesterday <laughs> by by the Saints, which is, you know, my hometown uh, of Slidell, Louisiana. So. Um, it was a good day when it's a good day anytime the, the, the Packers lose. And so if there's any Packers <laughs> fans watching, I'm laughing at you. Even though we lost too, I'm still laughing at you guys because you, you guys lost work. That's fantastic. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you so much for being a force for good in this space. The work that you and your team are doing is fantastic. And it's so critical and necessary. Uh, we look forward to watching and supporting your continued success, and we hope the same for your Chicago Bears as well. Um, so thanks again for joining us. I'd like to now welcome my colleague, Michael Brown, who is Visa's principal U.S. economist. He is joining to share insights on the current economic environment for small businesses. Michael, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Kim, and good morning uh, on behalf of the economics team here at uh, Visa. A little hard to uh, follow an NFL star, but I'll do my best uh, in the realm of economics this morning. My forte uh, is forecasting the economy. And if you take a look, the first thing uh, I need to disclose is that um, I will be making some forward-looking statements. I'm an economist, I make predictions about the economy. Uh, unfortunately for me and my team, not everything I say comes true. So just uh, keep in mind, I'm not providing investment advice here. This is simply Visa's view on the economy as it stands today. So our roadmap for this morning uh, will begin with uh, the uh, a broad overview of the economic landscape. And then I'm going to transition in the second half of the presentation to really focus on three key aspects of the small business sector. Aid the issues they're facing, small businesses are facing today, and the efficiencies that they're building in out of necessity. And it's really that last one, the efficiencies that are that is so inspiring about the small business space and frankly what excites us here at Visa working with small businesses and helping them grow is their willingness to innovate and really push the envelope. So uh, I'm excited to share some insights around that aspect of the small business space as well. So let's begin with the broad economic landscape here. Um, with First with our forecast for the economy, um, there are a couple of key themes that we really build into our economic outlook uh, as of our August forecast. 
And the first is inflation pressures. And any of you that have been purchasing raw materials for your business, whether that's labor in the service sector or uh, goods in the manufacturing sector for inputs, prices are going up across the board. So we'll talk about that uh, in, in a lot of detail. Sort of related to the pricing pressure phenomenon is the global supply chain disruptions. Not only has uh, the, the multiple surges in virus cases in the U.S. and globally impacted these supply chains, but uh, we continue to see these multiple waves of virus outbreaks, uh, primarily in Asia and, and parts of Europe, that have really uh, gummed up the work, so to speak, in the global supply chain. Um, in terms of uh, the other sort of core themes that we have built into our outlook, um, government stimulus. So we've seen a, a number of waves of stimulus to combat the negative impact of the virus on the U.S. economy, both last year and uh, this year. Those are going to start. We're starting to see some of that stimulus wear off a little bit. And as we transition into next year, um, you know, I like to describe it as the economy standing on its own two legs again uh, without uh, as much government stimulus support. And then uh, finally, you know, the consumer spending outlook, it's, it's going to downshift to its long run average. And that's key. We're not talking about a slowdown in consumer spending. We're talking about a moderation in consumer spending following what has been uh, a lot of pent up demand over the last couple of quarters. So what does the forecast hold? Well, if you take a look at our forecast for the economy from now to the end of 2022, you can see this year we're calling for 5.9% year-over-year GDP growth, and that's coming off of a contraction of 3.5% last year. So again, uh, some of the, the high elevated uh, sort of growth that we're seeing this year is simply that bounce back effect. Now, you look at 2022, and it might be a little disappointing when you put it in uh, comparison to this year at 3.5%, but that's still a full percentage point above our long-run average of about 2.5% year-over-year growth in the economy. So, uh, again, the core message here is more of a downshift or normalization, if you will, in economic activity rather than uh, sort of an outright uh, slowdown. So as we sort of think about the core driver of the U.S. economy, one sector near and dear to our hearts is obviously consumer spending. It also accounts for roughly 70 percent of the economy. You can see this second quarter of this year, we topped out right around 20 percent year over year consumer spending growth. And as I mentioned, stimulus effects are starting to uh, fade into the background. We still have that child tax credit that began in July. That's going to persist through the end of the year. And we think on the margin will support consumption growth. But as we get into the middle to latter half of 2022, uh, we start getting back to the uh, upper four to five percent year over year growth in consumer spending that we had uh, prior to the pandemic. So again, uh, sort of the great moderation there. So how are consumers spending today? Uh, a lot of small businesses, very retail focused. And the one thing that we've struggled with a little bit as economists and analysts is looking back at 2020, we had such low levels of spending that doing year over year comparisons doesn't make a lot of sense. So the bubbles I'm showing you here by category represent spending relative to their level the same month in 2019. So you can see closely that, um, you know, a lot of what we're seeing greater spending on relative to 2019 is stuff. It's goods, recreational goods, groceries, durable goods, clothing, home furnishings, right? Those sectors that are still in that recovery mode, they're getting close to that zero recovered mode, uh, transportation, uh, personal care services, hotels, recreational services. So it's the services side of the economy that we still haven't seen a full recovery in, at least through the month of June, uh, our most recent data here. So what is driving the rebound in consumption growth? And this is where things get a little bit more nuanced. So early on, uh, when the pandemic hit, we started to see lower income households have a little bit more robust consumer confidence. And as we sort of progressed um, through uh, the last uh, several months here, we've seen higher income households 
lead the way in terms of aggregate consumer confidence. Uh, but you can see again, it's still mon, uh, middle and lower income households that have fairly elevated confidence levels. And what we've noticed is those higher income households are sort of correlated with the virus outbreak story. Um, think about it through the lens of a lot of higher income households uh, tend to dine out more. They tend to do a lot more international travel. And those two categories in particular are most susceptible to uh, sort of concerns about virus outbreaks. And what is fascinating though, is when you take a look at the recovery this time around, it's lower and middle income households that are really driving the rebound and the consumer spending recovery. Higher income households are not contributing as much to that aggregate spending growth. And again, it's for the reasons that I've cited, the dining out, the cross-border or international travel uh, just hasn't gone back to its sort of pre-pandemic levels. And that's holding back the aggregate consumption of higher income households. Now, all of this is relative to sort of pre-pandemic levels. So that'll give you some sense of, of who's really driving uh, the, the core of the spending growth uh, in the US. Now we think, as you can probably imagine, that these middle and lower income households primarily have benefited from the stimulus effects uh, that uh, sort of uh, came on the heels of the multiple packages that we passed. Now, something that we're hearing a lot about in the small business space is the labor market and challenges around getting labor. And I'll talk to this uh, in, in the uh, sort of small business section in a moment. But from an aggregate U.S. economics perspective, a couple of core themes, we tend to look at something called the employment rate. So how many people as a share of the working age population are actually employed? And you can see very closely here that that employment rate is still nowhere near the level it was pre-pandemic. Now, part of this, of course, is the continued sort of gradual recovery in the economy. But another component of it is a large amount of baby boomers in particular selecting to retire uh, in the wake of this, this downturn as well. So we are dealing with a much smaller labor force size and employment base than we had before the pandemic. Now, there's another dimension of this that is very concerning to me as a social scientist, and that is the participation rate and the employment to population ratio of women in particular. Our sincere hope was with the return to in-person learning and childcare services this fall, that we would start seeing this employment to population ratio rise for women. And you can see it has not moved uh, over the summer months. So we sincerely hope this changes. This is critical for the continued economic expansion. We have higher educational attainment rates for women than men, uh, primarily out of uh, college uh, graduation rates. And so we're talking about a shortage of a lot of skilled workers when we're talking about uh, a much lower um, women employment rate. So again, very, very concerning on that front that we hope uh, we start seeing some improvement in the months ahead. Now, the other dimension uh, of, of this recovery is trying to measure how tight the labor market is. Now, this is a big uh, sort of hot button issue among a lot of economists. There's a lot of debate about this. And one of the measures that I like to look at is the job openings per unemployed person. So of the pool of, of, of available unemployed workers, how many job openings do we have? And you can see here, anytime we rise above that one level, it implies an extremely tight labor market. We have more job openings than we have unemployed workers to fill them. And you'll notice right before the recession, that dark gray line, the pandemic hit, we were dealing with a very, very tight labor market. Now you fast forward to the most recent data here through June, and you can see we're back above that one level. So by my math, we are dealing with an extremely tight labor market, which is, as I mentioned, primarily driven by uh, the lack of women coming back into the workforce, as well as a large number of retirements that we saw over uh, the last 18 months or so. So we are back to that very tight uh, labor market environment. Now, one of the other challenges here is that we are starting to see the tight labor market manifest itself in terms of higher prices for services and even for goods. 
So I'm showing you here both producer and consumer prices. Producer prices are what businesses are paying for their input cost, and consumer prices are how they're passing that along to consumers. Both are rising at unbelievable rates uh, relative to what we've seen over the last 20 years. Um, and you can see very closely uh, the producer price index just shy of about uh, seven and a half, eight percent on a year over year basis with consumer prices up uh, about five and a half percent on a year over year basis. Now, when you break this down, I've, I've mentioned sort of this goods and services dichotomy and spending on the goods side. We're seeing much higher inflation on stuff, on goods. And we attribute this primarily to the global supply chain disruption. Probably the most talked about in the media is uh, the silicon computer chip uh, and microchip shortages that are affecting auto manufacturers. Many of the major auto producers here in uh, the United States and around the world have had to slow or even idle production. Um, and that is having a result on uh, you know, new car prices, used car prices, so on and so forth. So goods prices up fairly sharply. When we take a look at the services side, um, we're not seeing as sharp of increases in consumer prices, but those producers on the services side are dealing with significantly higher input costs, which more often than not is, is the labor uh, input. So that helps me set up a little bit about what's coming next um, from the Federal Reserve and the interest rate outlook. So if I'm sitting in your shoes as a small business owner and I'm trying to figure out where interest rates are going next, one of the things that I tend to look at very closely is something called the PCE deflator, personal consumption expenditure deflator. This is what the Federal Reserve is using to help determine when they should start raising interest rates. And you can see very clearly here that they target right around a 2% rate. Now that's a long run target, so it's okay that we're above it for a short period of time, but um, the persistence above this 2% target, in my view, is becoming a little bit concerning. And there is a risk here that if we don't start raising interest rates soon, then to combat this inflation, we could deal with uh, some challenges on that, that front. So that sort of takes us to when will the Fed start taking away some of the stimulus or the punch bowl, if you will, uh, that they've been providing to the U.S. economy? Well, they're not going to start out just raising interest rates. Um, the Chairman Jay Powell of the Federal Reserve has indicated that he expects um, interest rate hikes to be well uh, down the road uh, relative to today. And you can see here that the first step that the Fed is likely to take later this year, more likely than not, is to start tapering what we call tapering or slowing the pace of asset purchases. Right now, they're buying 80 billion a month in U.S. Treasuries um, and 40 billion a month in mortgage backed securities. So as you can imagine, these things sort of uh, flow through to um, uh, mortgage rates as well. And just as a reminder here of the importance of the housing market to small businesses, the number one source of uh, lending collateral for small businesses is usually homeowner equity. So when you start seeing higher mortgage interest rates, that tends to slow uh, that appreciation of homeowner equity. So mid next year, uh, we think that the Federal Reserve will begin signaling that interest rate hikes are on the horizon. Um, and then the first rate hike, in our view, is likely in the first quarter of 2023. So nothing to worry about in the near future. Um, but the bottom line is that when we're talking about the interest rate outlook, um, it's really down to um, when the Federal Reserve will um, start uh, tapering their asset purchases. That could affect medium and long term interest rates. And then the other dimension to this is the fact that short term interest rates are likely to start rising uh, as well. So think about it from a small business credit card um, perspective. So if you're using your uh, hopefully visa branded small business debit uh, or credit card, rather uh, that credit card interest rate, if it's variable, could rise when the Fed starts raising its interest rates. But again, that's likely 2023, not a 2022 sort of story. So let's transition here to the small business outlook and talk about some of the challenges uh, that small businesses are still facing, even in the wake of uh, the pandemic. And the first 
data point I really want to share with you is what we call transactions. Now, transactions are the number of basically swipes, if you will, uh, or taps uh, of a consumer. So we're not talking about dollar amounts here. This is a very good proxy for sort of real demand or foot traffic, if you will, into these various industries. And if you just look at the transaction data, you can see um, retail, healthcare, restaurant, and quick service restaurants or QSRs uh, continue to sort of lag this recovery. Um, uh, retail services, I should say. Retail goods, home improvement supply, department and apparel stores have bounced back in terms of their transactions. Now, what's interesting is when you look at dollar sales, the dollar amounts, we see every industry starting to see higher sales. Now, there's an important story here because when you see this separation between transactions and sales, in light of what I just talked about in higher inflation, I tend to focus when inflation is rising on transactions. And by that measure, we've yet to see a full recovery in that retail services, healthcare and restaurant space. And so it's the reason why there's this mixed message that while small business revenues may be bouncing back, it doesn't mean that the foot traffic or the consumer throughput is really uh, materializing. So a uh, very, very important uh, sort of dichotomy there on that front. So the other aspect of this is we have seen a tremendous amount of aid to small businesses. So we certainly credit uh, the Small Business Administration and all of the dedicated individuals there uh, working to get this aid to small businesses. You can see through April of 2020 to the, roughly the end of December of last year, 80% of small business firms that were surveyed by the Census Bureau uh, reported that they received some form of new assistance. And when you look at even uh, from the end of December through July of this year, still about 55% of those survey respondents are still uh, receiving some new assistance uh, from uh, mostly the federal government. So again, very impressive sort of outreach and, and impact on the small business sector, so critical uh, to the economy as, as both Kim and Matt have, have sort of alluded to earlier. And the result of this, as you can imagine, is we haven't seen as much demand for small business lending and borrowing. Uh, the aid, the tax credit programs have sort of put a pause on borrowing. So uh, that's great uh, that we're seeing this level of aid uh, to sort of uh, to supplant some of the, the headwinds of borrowing uh, that, that uh, can certainly impact the small business space. So. Let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges in the small business space. First, some good news. Optimism uh, among small businesses is rebounding. Now, there's two sort of ways that we can look at small business optimism. There's what we call soft data, which is how are businesses feeling or uh, their outlook for the economy. Uh, and then there's the hard data, which I tend to weight a little bit heavier, which is what are businesses actually doing? Are you buying new equipment? Are you hiring workers? Are you actively expanding the business? And when you look at that hard data measure, which is the dark blue line here on the left, you can see very clearly that that hard data, what they're actually doing is in fact improving. So um, while we're a long way from a full recovery in the small business space, it is very, very uh, positive to see this sort of high uh, rate of this hard data uh, commitment to expansion, if you will, uh, in many cases. But that doesn't mean there are not challenges uh, facing small businesses. According to the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, you can see the number one challenge among small business owners is the quality of the labor. They're struggling to find the skilled labor that they need to operate effectively. They're also concerned about tax policy and regulatory changes. Uh, regulatory changes, meaning both federal, state, and local, um, as well as inflation. I've mentioned that. Um, and then, of course, cost of labor uh, is certainly high on the list as well uh, among major concerns.
So I mentioned labor a couple of times now. Um, not surprisingly, we are starting to see staffing shortages in the small business space. You can see very clearly that roughly 60% of uh, small businesses surveyed uh, by the NFIB are reporting either a significant, moderate, or mild uh, staffing shortage. So major, major concern. And you can see how are these businesses responding to the staffing shortage? Well, out of all the things that they're trying, most common is increasing wages. And as you can imagine, we've seen a larger, uh, a number of larger companies announce minimum wage hikes. And this is obviously impacting the small business space as well, as in order to attract and retain workers, they're having to raise uh, wages as well. So uh, again, it is uh, certainly yet another challenge dealing with this robust uh, recovery and tight labor market. So how are uh, small businesses responding to the inflation environment? Well, um, they're starting to increase sales prices, or if they haven't increased sales prices, they're starting to plan those uh, price increases. And so again, higher labor costs, the need for um, sort of the, the, the offset these higher input costs, whether it's a good in production or the labor input, uh, again, these firms are in fact passing these prices along to consumer. And just as the small business space is critical to understanding the employment outlook, it is also very critical in understanding the inflation outlook. When we see small businesses raising prices, that means that there's likely to be elevated inflation for a longer period of time. So how do we combat as business owners some of the challenges? Well, there's two ways you can do it. You can try to continue to raise prices, continue to try to attract uh, labor at higher cost, or we can start getting innovative. And it has been fascinating. Primarily, my experience has been with restaurants uh, dining out, but we have seen new technology really being introduced in a number of small businesses. Um, as you can see here, um, among small businesses, business owners, uh, about 30% have said that they've introduced some new technology to enhance productivity. Uh, among some of these um, are, you know, QR codes. So I was just traveling to uh, the state of Florida last week and almost every um, restaurant we went into, you had to use a QR code to pull up the menu. And in some cases, I was even using that QR code to pay the bill at the end of the meal. So again, that cuts down on the staff interaction time with the customer, trying to remove some of the burden on the waiter or waitress as they're servicing a larger number of customers uh, facing the staffing shortage. So again, uh, very impressive sort of innovation going on. Um, and these things are uh, boosting productivity. Other examples, we've, uh, my colleague Glenn McGuire, who's our principal AP economist in, in Asia based in Singapore, uh, has noticed a massive surge in app usage, business productivity apps, whether it's uh, you know, accounting software or other forms of, of business productivity enhancement. A lot of small businesses are turning to app-based uh, platforms in order to provide those uh, sort of uh, innovations, help them with accounting, bookkeeping, inventory management, all to adjust again to uh, a much, much tighter uh, labor market uh, dynamic that we're facing. All right, so I'm going to uh, just quickly summarize some of the, the key aspects of this. So on the screen in front of you, uh, I just wanted to, to make you aware that we do publish a number of research pieces, not just on the small business space, but on the economy overall. So if you found any of the content here today helpful, you can subscribe at visa.com slash economic insights. You can subscribe right at the top of the page. Feel free to, uh, to get that. It's complimentary uh, as a, a service Visa provides to sort of help uh, our continued small business outreach efforts. Uh, we, work, we partner closely with, with Kim and other colleagues around the world really uh, to provide you economic insights to help drive your business. And I guess sort of to, to put a, a big bow on all my comments here today before we transition uh, to the Q&A portion is, you know, the, the small business uh, component of the U.S. economy is so critical. 
um, that it's, it's driving everything from employment growth to the inflation trends we see. So the small business challenges that we talked about of labor quality, concerns about supply chain shortages, input costs, all of those are a microcosm of what's going on broadly in the U.S. economy. And those small businesses, business challenges are our challenges as an economy uh, as a whole to deal with. So uh, in terms of timing, I've seen a few questions come in around um, the timing of when we could get some supply chain uh, pressures alleviated. The best knowledge we have at this point is sometime early in 2022. Um, we, we have a number of contacts, as you can imagine, in various industries, including the shipping industry, uh, that say that they think some of these supply chain issues could be uh, worked through uh, through the end of the year and, and into January. But, you know, the, the big challenge is if we continue to see a surge in virus cases, not just in the U.S., but globally, that could certainly uh, de delay that, that impact and recovery. So I hope you found those high-level comments uh, helpful. I'm uh, My favorite part of this is hearing what's on your mind. So if you have a question, please feel free to use that uh, Q&A function. More than happy to take as many of these as I can work through here in the time remaining. Um, so um, the first question here is, what are the thoughts around the possibility of stagflation um, and it's, it's a fantastic question just to, to, to sort of explain what stagflation is. It means that we have high inflation rates, but slow economic growth. So the U.S. economy went through a period of stagflation in the mid to late 1980s. And, you know, it was very uh, frustrating time because we were dealing with extremely high interest rates. And, and modest economic growth. As you can imagine, when you start raising interest rates uh, without sort of core growth going on uh, to combat higher inflation, that's a problem. Well, so in terms of the probability that we see stagflation, I think it's fairly low at this point. And let me explain uh, my, my point of view on this. So in, in stagflation, one of the things that creates these challenges is uh, you know, going back to the 1980s example is if you think about the tools in the toolbox to combat inflation in the 1980s, it was mostly interest rate hikes. And um, today uh, there is there are a lot more tools in the toolbox. We call it QE or quantitative easing. And this is the Federal Reserve's asset purchases. So we think that throttling back specifically things like mortgage backed security purchases will help. Uh, put upper pressure on mortgage rates, and that will slow some of the churn in the housing market and hopefully some of the home price appreciation. So that's one dimension of this. But the other dimension of this, and it's an active debate among economists and, and frankly, members of uh, the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee as well, which is how transitory or short term, short lived will the inflation pressures be? And in our view, we think that it's going to be a short term phenomenon, meaning that, yes, we're going to be dealing with higher prices for a little while until we get through these supply chain disruptions. And as I said, our view is that it's likely early 2022 when we get through those disruptions and then prices will start moderating a little bit. We won't see as aggressive of price growth. Now, if we're all wrong about that and we continue to see these high inflation rates, then and only then do I think stagflation concerns really rise significantly. But frankly, as I mentioned with our economic forecast, we think that the economy is going to be firing above its potential rate both uh, this year and next year. And, and so uh, in, that, in light of that, we, we don't worry about stagnant growth at that point given three and a half percent year over year GDP growth, at least at this point. So um, I would say that there's a lower risk at that. Um, so any forecast about how online businesses will look next year? Um, you know, it's a, a fantastic question. One of the sources that we look at for e-commerce utilization is produced by the U.S. Department of Commerce, their Census Bureau in particular. They show us the retail sales online as a share of of sort of retail sales, excluding automobiles. And when you look at that measure, it has sort of uh, plateaued or, or uh, flatlined a little bit. It's not going up anymore in terms of that e-commerce penetration rate. But the good news is 
that when you compare pre-pandemic with post-pandemic, there is a stickiness. There is a marked level shift up in the utilization of online and e-commerce channels that appears to be holding several quarters now um, after, uh, you know, last, last, basically the middle of last year during the pandemic. So our view is that the online spend, the e-commerce utilization is here to stay. People who had not experienced or utilized e-commerce in a major way uh, started to do it. I'm an example of this. I never purchased groceries uh, online before, and I'm, I'm now doing that. Uh, started last year, and, uh, and that behavior is now sticky to me. So I, I'm, I'm continuing that behavior, even though uh, I can still go to the store and purchase some of these things. So that's a classic example. Um, another question here, uh, any noticeable regional differences in the bounce back? Fantastic question. Uh, we, we just started uh, about three months ago producing our economic forecast on a regional basis. So again, that's available at the website on the screen in front of you. Um, and you can see uh, when you look at our most recent report, there's two pockets leading the recovery, and that is primarily the U.S., West, the Mountain West region in particular. So talking about Colorado, Idaho, um, Wyoming, some of those areas. Um, in terms of those areas that are not bouncing back as quickly, the upper Midwest, I mentioned a lot of manufacturing in that part of the country. The supply chain disruptions are really debilitating a lot of the small businesses and medium sized businesses for that matter uh, in the Midwest. Uh, the same thing up in New England. So um, you know, New England, we had a lot of tourism uh, go away in, in cities like New York, Philadelphia, so on and so forth. So uh, those areas struggling to, to bounce back. So we see a slower, it's still recovering, but at a slower pace in the Midwest and New England, a much faster pace in the Mountain West, uh, just to give you a regional flair there. Um, so thoughts on the housing market moving forward? Yeah, fantastic question. We've seen unbelievable home price appreciation over the last year. And uh, there's a couple of factors driving the housing market. One is, I mentioned the Federal Reserve buying mortgage-backed securities. So that, that puts downward pressure on mortgage rates. We also saw that the pandemic uh, had us all hunkered down at home. We started looking around at the four walls and saying, you know what, I need more space. So we started to see a lot of folks move to suburban areas, out of urban areas for larger uh, real estate footprints and, and a bigger backyard. That trend's starting to subside, but there's still this sort of uh, persistent demand out there. And one of the core drivers, frankly, is that millennials um, are driving a lot of the new home purchase activity. So uh, they're, they're now to the point where they have families or are starting to um, sort of move from the metro areas to the suburbs and, and take a longer commute. Um, and, and certainly flex work is having a role to play here as well. As you can imagine, with companies going to hybrid models of a few days a week in the office or part time in the office, uh, and, and some work from home, that is all driving uh, some of the real estate activity as well. Now, our view is that once the Federal Reserve starts tapering those mortgage-backed security purchases, that 30-year mortgage rate is going to start rising modestly. And as a result of the home price appreciation we've seen, we're going to start seeing the housing market slow down a little bit. And we're already seeing evidence of that in a number of areas around the country, including the U.S. South uh, region, which typically drives most of the real estate activity. So, um, so, and, and you know, spilling over to the, the next question here, which is what's the impact on the, the home improvement sector of businesses? Um, it, it's a great question because last year during the pandemic, um, even those folks that didn't relocate were remodeling their home at a, an impressive clip whether that was building a home office or uh, you know, buying flowers for the garden or, or finding other hobbies to do to, to fix up the house. Um, we see that moderating in the months ahead, as you can imagine with the pandemic uh, sort of subsiding a little bit. Um, you know, when we look at uh, the return to office in particular, 
that's going to be key. When we see that return to office, we're likely to see a moderation in home improvement activity. Now, the, the, on the flip side of that is, you know, I just mentioned that millennials are purchasing homes. A lot of those homes are probably going to be existing homes since we don't have a large inventory of new homes on the market. And so that would imply some uh, upside uh, potential for home improvement as well. So I don't think the demand will dry up in the home improvement space, but uh, certainly um, certainly a factor there uh, that could, could lift it. Um, do you find the labor market uh, being tight in specific segments? Yes. Um, the you know, the, the, first of all, the labor market tightness is uh, it's extremely tight in almost every major industry that we track. But the hardest hit is leisure and hospitality. And there's a couple of reasons for this. I mentioned the retirements, but there's also a lingering legitimate concern about uh, the virus and concerns over uh, health and safety. So if you think about the leisure and hospitality space, uh, more often than not, these are workers who are on the front line dealing with consumers face to face. And the result of that is there is still residual concern about, um, you know, the potential for, uh, you know, getting the virus or, or getting sick. So um, that's holding back, we believe, uh, a lot of folks from participating in the labor market. Uh, and that's having an adverse impact on uh, the leisure and hospitality space. So, um, so thoughts on inflation and deflation. Um, frankly, the, the deflation is not even on the radar at this point. It's all about inflation. Uh, and I sort of alluded to the timing of that um, in, in terms of uh, inflation moderating later this year into early next year once supply chains uh, sort of get back uh, and, and bounce back a little bit. So I think I have time for a, a maybe one or two more questions here. As the world uh, is is uh, shaping right now with the coronavirus, uh, are there better paths for service companies uh, compared to good uh, good uh, industries? You know, uh, there, there's a couple of thoughts here around um, you know reshaping uh, the world, and that is sort of the utilization of uh, trying to figure out how to introduce technology, one that consumers are comfortable with. Uh, if I'm operating a service small business, it's not about, uh, oh, I wanna start using this app or this QR code. It's how are my customers going to respond to this change? Are they gonna perceive it as, oh, I'm not interacting with a waiter or waitress in this example um, you know, as often, and therefore I get less value out of dining out. I'm not one of those folks, but I work for a technology company, right? So, um, you know, it, it's it's going to be fascinating. I think the challenge as a small business owner is how do you as a business owner educate consumers on, um, you know, these new technologies and, and show that it's a better mousetrap, show that it's a better way of doing business. It helps them reduce the frictions in purchases. Um, I'm one of those folks that if there's a kiosk at the quick service restaurant, I would rather use the kiosk than uh, take that employee's time away from distributing the food behind the counter and helping customers uh, with, with other uh, concerns. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I think is uh, partly on the business owner to educate consumers, but also just trying it, trying these new technologies uh, to reduce frictions and increase productivity. There's no silver bullet here. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. You're all small business owners with, with many, many challenges on your plate. So uh, you're well aware of some of these things. But I think that we are going to have to find new ways uh, to, uh, to take a look uh, at, at how we can innovate. And, uh, you know, for, for our part as Visa, we're doing our best to uh, remove frictions at the point of sale. For example, contactless payments make a world of difference. Uh, you know, I was at the airport, as I mentioned over the weekend, it frustrates me to see people, you know, paying with cash, fumbling around, uh, holding up a very, very long line at the register uh, where they could just have to pay and move on. And so if I translate that to a, a small business space in service or other places, um, you know, that's a critical friction that can, can help, uh, you know, productivity gains as well.
So I'm looking at the clock here. I am out of time. Thank you all for uh, your engagement, your questions. I hope you found all the information here helpful. Again, visa.com slash economic insights if you want to gain more. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much for attending our session today. And on behalf of Visa and all of our partners here, uh, and, uh, the SBA and others, uh, thank you very much for tuning in for this Small Business Week session. And we look forward uh, to, to talking to you in the near future. Thank you.